Good evening, University of Scranton. So are we ready? Are we excited? I knew we would be. Well, welcome to the sixth annual Ignatian Values in Action Lecture. My name is Brian Kniff. I'm Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, and I want to welcome all of you, our, our students, our faculty, our staff, our friends in the community. Uh, we have this year, I'm told, a record number of alumni coming back for this event, so I especially want to recognize our alumni. Uh, we love, of course, to have you come back home to the University of Scranton, but especially for an event like this that's so deeply connected to our university's mission and identity. So I just want to say a couple of words, and that is that the Ignatian Values in Action Lecture is one of the most important ways that we introduce our first year students to the Jesuit and Catholic mission identity of our university. And as you all know, first year students, this is the third time we've had you come together as a convocation. And on the weekend you arrived, we brought you all together as the class of 2021. Less than two weeks after that, we all came together for the Mass of the Holy Spirit, the traditional opening of the academic year. And here we have you all together with about a thousand of your new best friends for this lecture. And it's a very important thing for us here at Scranton that we come together as a convocation with a sense of collective vocation to celebrate our Jesuit heritage and the core values of our university. So I just want to take care of a couple of organizational matters before we get started. First of all, your faculty always insists that I tell you students, turn off or put away your cell phones and, you know, pay attention like good University of Scranton students. Secondly, a couple of things about when the, the talk is over tonight. First of all, when Father Martin completes his remarks, we will have another appearance by our president, Father Herbert Keller, who will make a few concluding remarks. So stay seated, relax, and then after that, we will have a book signing over here to my right, your left. We're excited about that. So those of you who have been carrying around the Jesuit guide to almost everything for two, three, four, in the case of alums, and some of you really have, this is your chance, and other books too, and I think we're even selling a few books if you want to make a contribution. So all that being said, I would like to ask to invite to the podium my colleague and friend and neighbor in St. Thomas Hall, Father Patrick Rogers of the Society of Jesus, who's the executive director of our Jesuit Center. Thank you. Father James Martin is a Jesuit priest and author of numerous books and articles that include the New York Times bestseller, The Jesuit Guide to Almost Everything, A Spirituality for Real Life. This book, published in 2010, was the number one bestseller in Catholic books and remains one of the best-selling books about spirituality in the United States. His other books include another New York Times bestseller entitled Jesus, A Pilgrimage, and a novel entitled The Abbey, A Story of Discovery. Other books include Between Heaven and Mirth with Joy, Humor, and Laughter, Why Joy, Humor, and Laughter are at the Heart of the Spiritual Life, his memoir, My Life with the Saints, and A Jesuit Off-Broadway, Center Stage with Jesus, Judas, and Life's Big Questions. Father Martin's most recent book, Building a Bridge, How the Catholic Church and the LGBT Community Can Enter into a Relationship of Respect, Compassion, and Sensitivity, was published in the spring of 2017 to great acclaim. His articles have been published in America Magazine, Catholic Digest, The Tablet from London, England, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, 
the Boston Globe, the Philadelphia Inquirer, and O Magazine, among many others. He has commented on religion and spirituality in the national and international media, including National Public Radio's Fresh Air with Terry Gross, NPR's Weekend Edition, PBS NewsHour, Comedy Central's The Colbert Report, where he was the official chaplain to the Colbert Nation, Fox News Channel's The O'Reilly Factor, and Vatican Radio. He served as a commentator for ABC News during the 2013 Papal Conclave and during Pope Francis's visit to the United States in 2015. In the spring of 2017, Father Martin received the great distinction of being received into our royal family by accepting an honorary doctorate from our very own University of Scranton. We are pleased and proud to welcome back to our campus such a distinguished friend and alum. Ladies and gentlemen, let us give a proud royal welcome to Father James Martin. Thank you so much. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah, you know the story about the priest uh, who's at mass and he gets up to the microphone and he doesn't know the microphone's on and he's blowing in it and he taps on it. He's blowing in it, he taps on it. And he says, I think there's something wrong with this thing. And everybody says, and also with you. <laughs> That's a true story. Um, I am very happy to be back at Scranton, a place I really consider home. Uh, as Father Pat was saying, I was very honored uh, just a few months ago to receive a, a degree. And so technically, I am an alumnus of the University of Scranton. And so uh, when you see me at our 50th reunion, please be nice to me <laughs> when you will be 71 and I will be 106. Uh, first of all, uh, to my fellow royals, uh, first-year students, congratulations. Congratulations. You have just been given a great gift. Four years of college education at a great Jesuit school. And if you think about all the people in the world, where they're born, what kind of opportunities they have, who they have helping them, you are probably among the smallest percentage of people with this kind of opportunity, right? With this kind of unique opportunity, four years at a Jesuit school. So congratulations. And by the way, I'm a little biased about Scranton undergrads these days because not only am I an alum, but someone in my family is now one. Uh, my niece-in-law, Lauren Buscarino, I don't know if you're here. Where are you, Lauren? She's here somewhere. There she is. Oh, in the second row, of course. <laughs> so I am very pro-Scranton undergrad. Um, but, you know, whether or not someone in your family is a Jesuit, a priest, or an alumnus of Scranton, no matter who you are, where you're going to school, Scranton or some lesser Jesuit school like Fordham or St. Joe's, and there goes my honorary degree from Fordham. <laughs> There's something that you need to know, which is this. You are going to be very nervous the first few weeks and the first few months of school. And that is, I think, the dirty little secret of college. Everyone is nervous. Everyone. No matter how cool or chill the person next to you seems to be, they're nervous. I mean, unless you're a sociopath and have no feelings, which I think on the application form they said to check, you know, if you're a sociopath or not. You know, you're going to be nervous. It's natural. It's exciting being at college, but still, you're away from your family and your friends. You're in an unfamiliar environment. You know, even if you're from around here, you're wondering how you're going to do in your classes, how you're going to find your way around campus. Maybe farther down the line, what you'll major in. You're wondering about all these things. You're also wondering, why is John Oliver so focused on my city right now? <laughs> but most of all, most of all, if you're like most 
college freshman, you're wondering who my friends are going to be. You know, but that will all come. So here's the second dirty little secret. It's actually not dirty, it's just a little secret. It's okay not to know, okay? It's okay not to know. And that might be your mantra for your first few months here, maybe even your first year. It's okay not to know. It's okay not to know what your major is going to be. It's okay not to know exactly what you're going to do in life. It's okay not to know everything, right? You're not God. Here's another secret. You will make friends. As weird as that sounds, some of the people in this very room, think about it, whom you've not even met yet, may become friends that you will know your whole life, really. And funny enough, some of the people you meet on the first day who you think, oh my gosh, my new best friend, you'll like never see them again. <laughs> so just relax, the friendships will come naturally. So overall, you are probably feeling a combination of emotions, strong ones, nervous, tired, sad, excited, relieved, happy. Because you have a lot of great choices ahead of you. Which raises the inevitable question, how do I make them? How do I make good choices? Well, fortunately, you're in a Jesuit school, and the Jesuit tradition includes teaching people how to make healthy and life-giving decisions. I talk a little bit about that in the book, which, by the way, makes the perfect gift for your friends and family. Um, <laughs> so what does it mean, though, to be at a Jesuit school? Well, to understand that, you have to understand something about the founder of the Jesuits, St. Ignatius Loyola the statue of whom is uh, not too far from here. I think they call him Robot Ignatius, right? Um, so let me give you a little brief story about his life. St. Ignatius was born in 1491 in the Basque country of Spain. Initially, Ignatius wanted to be a great soldier and a knight. He was, believe it or not, very vain, you know, really proud of himself. And in his autobiography, he kept talking, he says this three times about how great his hair was. Okay, apparently Ignatius had really nice hair, just like me. Um, and he was very concerned about impressing women. He was also, I like to tell uh, people this, especially young people, he was also a real hothead and got into a lot of fights. He is, scholars say, the only saint with a notarized police record for brawling with an intent to, call, to cause bodily harm. In 1521, in a battle in Pamplona, Spain, his leg was shattered by a cannonball, which stopped him in his tracks, right? He was on this kind of path to being this great soldier and impressing the women, and this cannonball comes along. If you hang around uh, campus ministry, which I hope you do, you'll probably hear the expression, at some point in your career here at Scranton, a cannonball moment. Something that totally devastates us and forces us to reevaluate things. Maybe you've already had one of those in your life, a serious illness, a death in the family. So Ignatius is brought back to his family's house, his family castle actually, where he recuperates. He asks for something to read and all they have are books on the lives of the saints and a life of Christ, neither of which he is at all interested in. He could care less about this stuff. He wasn't particularly religious. But as Ignatius reads the books, something interesting happens to him inside. He's about 25 at the time. He starts to feel, when he thinks about following the example of the saints, he starts to feel happy and hopeful. He has this kind of feeling of, wow, this is really moving to me. And when he thinks about continuing his old pattern of, you know, basically trying to impress people, not simply impressing women, but impressing everybody, he feels kind of unhappy and despairing. And gradually he starts to notice how those two things are working within him. 
And that's the first seed of Jesuit spirituality. God gives us all the capacity to make good decisions. Basically, Ignatius and Ignatian, spiritu Ignatian spirituality is that of St. Ignatius or Jesuit spirituality, teaches us that we can make good decisions, right? All of you have so much in front of you. It's just great to look out and see all these young faces, but you know, you have to make good decisions. You can do that based on your own understanding of your morals, right? Your good, a good moral life, but also paying attention to your interior life. So it's not just outside in, it's not just what people tell you, the morals that they tell you, which are important, but it's also your own inner life because God is at work in there. And basically, Ignatius says that for good people, people who are, you know, trying to do good, the, the, the Spirit of God will comfort us, build us up, calm us down, and give us hope. And the paths that make us feel despairing and hopeless, right, are not coming from God. So anything that tells you, oh, this is hopeless, this is terrible, nothing can change, that's not coming from God. The ones that say, calm down, you can do this, it'll be okay, it's coming from God. It's God's spirit talking to you. It's called discernment, making decisions in a prayerful way. You can learn more about that again from campus ministry, from the Jesuits here, and from all of your teachers, from the staff, from the administration. They're all trained in Jesuit spirituality. It relies on the fundamental belief that God wants us to make good decisions and that God is going to help us, right? Sometimes it's the voice of your conscience. It's not just that God asks you to make good decisions or God wants you to make good decisions, but God's going to help you through your interior life. And that's, by the way, not just for Catholics and Christians, that's for everyone. So anyway, Ignatius turns around his life. He gives up his desire to be a knight. He spends a few months in extreme prayer in a cave, believe it or not, where he lives very austerely. He fasts for long periods of time. He doesn't sleep. He does kind of physical penances. And he does so much of this penance that he starts to ruin his health. Eventually, he realizes that this isn't working and he needs to take care of himself if he's going to get anything done in life. Wrecking his, health, wrecking his health, he decides, is not a good idea. So he changes his mind and he starts to eat and sleep more regularly. That's another insight about Ignatian spirituality that I hope you will remember. Going ahead sometimes means making a U-turn, right? It's okay to change your mind once in a while. That's why St. Ignatius Loyola is often called the patron saint of plan B, right? This doesn't work, we'll try something else. It's okay not to know everything at once. It's okay to change your mind. So Ignatius goes back to school, believe it or not, he's like 27 at this point, where he takes classes with young boys, like kids basically, right, in grammar school to learn his Latin because he's not very well educated. And then he finally goes to the University of Paris because, as scholars tell us, he couldn't get into Scranton. Um, the University of Paris was his safety school. Um, there he meets St. Francis Xavier and St. Peter Faber, who become his roommates. Of course, they weren't saints back then. It's not like he said, oh, I'm St. Ignatius. Oh, I'm St. Francis, Francis Xavier. Nice to meet you. Uh, so the Jesuit order, those were his roommates. The Jesuit order came out of three college roommates. Let's let that sink in for a bit especially for people who are in a triple. Um, and then to make a very long story short, he founded a religious order with these two men, St. Francis Xavier and St. Peter Faber, and a couple other people that he met at university. And they're soon asked by the Pope and people of their time to start colleges since they were particularly well-educated. And from there, we end up here at Scranton, right? That's Jesuit education and Jesuit education and history in a nutshell. Now, I have to say, before a few years ago, it was sometimes hard to explain to people what a Jesuit was. Like when I entered the Jesuits, someone said, I thought you were a Catholic. It's like, yeah, I am. Um, 
But now, fortunately, we have Pope Francis, the very first Jesuit pope. And if someone have it that way, probably the last one, too. He's shaking things up, as you know. Thanks to Pope Francis, you can easily see one of the endpoints of Jesuit spirituality and one of the endpoints of your Jesuit education, freedom. That's one of the goals of your education, freedom. Jesuit spirituality wants us to be free of anything that keeps us from becoming the person we're meant to be. Okay, the person who God means for you to be in order that we can serve others and in order that we can be happy. Even if you're not a Catholic or a Christian or a believer, I hope that you can come away from Scranton with a deeper understanding of the desire to be who you are. You know, God has already created you as this wonderful person, right? Short or tall, you know, black, brown, white, gay, straight, lesbian, transgender, anything, any ethnic nationality. God's already created you as this beautiful person, but God's not done with you yet. So it's this kind of process of becoming. So I hope you come away with a desire to become the person you're meant to be and the desire for service, the desire to be, as we Jesuits and our friends like to say, a man and woman for others. You know, interestingly, um, during uh, Hurricane Harvey a couple weeks ago, uh, there was a Jesuit school in Houston, there is a Jesuit school in Houston called Strake Jesuit High School. And some of the guys, it's, it's all male, some of the guys from Strake went around in boats and rescued people in Houston. And uh, we did an interview with uh, some of them at America Magazine where I work, which is a Catholic magazine. And the, the interviewer, a young woman, asked them, where did this come from? And they said, we wanted to be men for others. So this is Jesuit education, being a man and a woman for others, for someone else. So back to freedom. Pope Francis, I think, is probably the freest person you can imagine. Did you see him when he got, I don't know if you saw him, he was in uh, Colombia and he, he bumped his head and he cut his face and there was blood all over his cassock. He was totally free about that. Even when a reporter said to him, what happened? He goes, oh, someone punched me. I mean, very free, free to laugh at himself. You know, his most famous expression, who am I to judge about uh, LGBT people, is about the freedom to let other people be who they are. Who am I to judge indeed? He's also free to laugh. I mean, part of being yourself is being, you know, enjoying a good joke from once in a while, laughing at yourself as he did. Uh, you know, whenever he visits a city, uh, he visits, he usually visits the Jesuits in the city. You know, so if he were to come to Scranton, he would come to the University of Scranton to visit with the Jesuits privately, in a sense. Two years ago, for example, he visited Sri Lanka. When he was at the airport at the welcoming ceremony, they had, believe it or not, 40 elephants decked out in silk and bells and, like, elephant clothes, I guess. Um, I was actually disappointed there weren't 40 elephants here to greet me. Uh, so then a few days later, Pope Francis is, this is a true story, Pope Francis is in Manila, and they have 40 Jesuits gathered to meet him. It's a true story. And you know, Jesuits dress pretty casually. I mean, and some of them were like this. And I saw the pictures and I was, honestly, I was like, dude, put a jacket on, the Pope's there, you know? <laughs> so the Jesuits were standing around and some of them actually, this is, you'll see this. Some of them were like, like this. And I thought, oh my gosh. So, um, so the 40 Jesuits in Manila are there, you know, because he's a Jesuit. We Jesuits dress pretty casually. And uh, the head of the Jesuits, called the Provincial, is there. And to break the ice, he says, oh, Holy Father, isn't this interesting? In Sri Lanka, you had 40 elephants to greet you. But here in Manila, you have 40 Jesuits. And the Pope said, the elephants were much better dressed. <laughs> so, so here are a few insights from Jesuit spirituality that I thought might help all of you in the first year, uh, specifically as you begin your, begin your college career. First of all, as I said, please be yourself, okay? Be yourself. 
God made you who you are. Now that might sound obvious to be like, uh, I came to this damn thing so he could tell me to be myself. But actually a lot of us try to be someone else. We think that if only we were, well, whatever, taller, smarter, richer, better at sports, better looking, which is completely subjective by the way, or whatever, we would be happier. But when you compare yourself to other, you know what happens? Here's what always happens. You compare what you know is your life, which is kind of a mixed bag, right? Good and bad. You know your life very well, good and bad, with what looks like someone else's perfect life, which is false, because the other person is trying to present, you know, more or less a perfect life. So you usually see only the good in the other person's life, and you see the good and bad in your life. So guess what happens? Your life loses out. It's kind of a rigged game. If you compare yourself, you will end up miserable. You have no idea what's going on inside of another person. As the old Jesuit expression goes, compare and despair. So try to stay away from that. Plus, if you dig a little deeper, and this was one of the great revelations for me in college, and I know that you will with your friends here, you will find that everyone's life is a mixed bag. Even the person who seems to have it all together, you will discover their life is not perfect. Second, as I mentioned before, you can make good decisions. So many decisions may seem overwhelming now, but as I said, God gives you the ability to make good, healthy, and life-giving decisions. You can rely on wisdom from your family, from good friends, from religious traditions, whatever they may be. But you also have God working within you moving you to avoid things that are bad for you and embracing things that are good. And again, you don't have to know it all. And you can make some U-turns just like St. Ignatius did. Third, Jesuit education is focused on something called Cora Personalis. Raise your hands if you've heard Cora Personalis. Okay, now you can put your hands down. Excellent. I will now introduce Cora Personalis to you. It means, it's a great concept in Jesuit education. It means care for the whole person. Cora is care personalis person. Care for the whole person. I just love that. Jesuit schools care for all of you, not just the intellect and the body, but the soul too, the spiritual life. Because we're not human beings living a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. People here at Scranton will care for you body, mind, and soul. There are people, many, if you get in trouble in any way, or if you're worried or frightened, who will care for you, or something terrible happens in your family, or to you, or your friends, God forbid, who will care for you. And not only counselors and advisors and campus ministry, but everyone, the administration, the faculty, everyone, they are here to care for you. Of course, part of Cora Personalis is caring for yourself, reverencing yourself, and reverencing one another. God dwells in all of you. And so you are all beloved by God, black, white, brown, gay or straight, rich or poor. So the question is, can you reverence yourself? Do you ever think about it that way? Can you reverence yourself? And that means not only caring for your body, you know, not getting drunk every night and, not, and never getting enough sleep, but making healthy decisions that will help you to flourish as a person. It also means reverencing others. That includes questions of sex, right? Can you reverence the other person instead of taking advantage of them? But on a more basic level, it means reverencing who they are, letting them be who they are, and trying to love them as they are. That goes for people who seem different from you. You know, you look out over this audience, there's a lot of different kinds of people here. While you're at Scranton, don't be afraid to get to know them. In fact, seek out people beyond your comfort zone right? Seek out people who disagree with you, who stretch you, who challenge you. It's part of the fun of being at college. Fourth, 
I want to talk about a word that you might be surprised about, which is desire. Desire is an important part of Jesuit spirituality. But you know, desire has a kind of bad reputation in a lot of religious circles. When many people think of the term, they think of two things, sexual desire or material wants, both of which are often condemned by religious leaders. But the first, sexual desire, is one of the greatest gifts of God to humanity. Without sexual desire, uh, not to put too fine a point on it, this room would be empty. Now, it has to be guided and used in an adult way, but it's essential. Second, the desire for material things is part of our natural desire for a healthy life. You know, food, shelter, clothing. Why this emphasis on desire right now? Because desire is a key way that God communicates with you. Now, holy desires in your life are different than, you know, like I want a new car or I want the new iPhone that just came out, which frankly I can't see a difference in, I read the papers. Um, instead, I'm talking about our deepest desires, the ones that shape our lives, desires that help us know who we are to become and what we are to do. It's the kind of thing you're probably thinking about right now. What am I supposed to do? You know, who do I really want to become? Our deep desires help us to know God's desires for us and how much God desires to be with us. And God, I think, wants us to notice and name those desires. You know, there's a story in the Gospel of Mark um, about a guy named Bartimaeus, who was a blind beggar. He's sitting beside the side of the road, and he calls out, Son of David, one of Jesus' traditional titles, have pity on me. And Jesus comes up to the guy and says, what do you want me to do for you? Now, you know, a lot of people might say, well, you know, he's blind, I mean, and you're Jesus, so, like, you sh it should be obvious, Jesus. He says, Rabbi, I want to see. Now, why is Jesus doing that? Why is Jesus, I mean, why doesn't he just go, you know, ding, or however, whatever sound Jesus made when he healed somebody? Um, it's probably more impressive than that. Uh, it's probably like organ music, because that's what happens in the movies, there's organ music. So a few years ago, I realized why Jesus may have asked Bartimaeus, the blind man, what he wanted. Naming our desires tells us something about who we are. When you can finally say, you know what? I do want to be a nurse. I do want to be a physical therapist. You know that? I do. It's very freeing. This is what I want in life. Naming those desires also makes us more grateful when we finally receive the fulfillment of our hopes. Also, I think what Jesus is doing as an aside is giving Bartimaeus his dignity. I'm not just going to do this to you. I'm going to ask you. I'm going to let you name those things. Expressing those desires also brings us into a closer relationship with God. Otherwise, it would be like never telling a friend your innermost thoughts, right? Imagine never being honest with God about what you want. When we tell God our desires, our relationship to God deepens. Desire is a primary way that God leads all of us and that God will lead you to discover who you are and what you're meant to do. You know, you're going to feel a natural attraction as you're going through your courses. Gosh, I love this course. This is so interesting. Pay attention to that. That might be God calling you. That's the way vocation works. The deepest longings of our hearts are our holy desires. And our deep desires, those desires that lead us to become who we are, are God's desires for us. How else would God speak to you? other than through those desires. They are also the way that God fulfills God's own desires for the world by calling you to be a nurse, for example, right? How else would God populate the world with nurses? So maybe it's a good time to ask a question that really changed my own life. And I was not asked until I was 27, around Ignatius's age. And if you haven't heard it, well, you'll hear it from me. What would you do if you could do anything you wanted to do? What would you do if you could do anything you wanted? College is a good time to start thinking about that and sifting through some of those questions. 
So finally, Ignatian spirituality centers on gratitude. Gratitude. In fact, Ignatius said that ingratitude was the worst and most abominable, abomin I can't say it, abominable of sins. The worst sin and the origin of all sins. Ingratitude. In fact, at the end, at Ignatius said at the end of the day, you should pause, look over the day, and remember the good things that happened and give thanks to God for them. It's a great little prayer called the examination of conscience. I talk about that in the book. You start off by centering yourself in God's presence. You call to mind things you're grateful for, right? You thank God. Then you review the day step by step and see where God was active. You express sorrow for any sins or failings, and then you ask God for the grace for the next day. It's a great way to end the day and to look back because we're so focused on kind of moving ahead, especially as Americans, you know, especially as college students. It's like, what's next? What's the next class? What's my next test? That you tend to have, you tend to not sit with the graces that you've already had. So be grateful, pause. And that may be a good insight for all your years here. These four years are going to fly by. Pretty soon, you will be standing in caps and gowns and saying, wow, remember that boring Jesuit who talked to us at the beginning of our year? Who the hell was that? So be intentional about stopping to take it all in. And again, be grateful just for who you are. I'm going to end my little talk by saying that I am grateful for all of you, for making the choice to get a Jesuit education, for making the choice to come to Scranton, for opening yourself up to what God will do for you, for being patient with God and letting God do God's work. I know it seems like a nervous time, but I hope it helps you to know that God is with you and God has just given you a great big gift. And the big question to answer is, what will you do with this great and precious gift that you have been given? Thank you very much. And to quote Jesus Christ, go Royals. Thank you for that applause. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I just wanted to take a moment uh, tonight as we end to thank Father Martin for being here tonight and on our campus today. I hope you realize that if he wanted to, he could be speaking every night of the year in a different school or parish across this country. So I thank him for choosing to come to Scranton. He honors our school community by his presence tonight as he honored us by accepting our honorary degree last spring. On that occasion, the school presented Father Martin with not 40 elephants, but with some Scranton gear, some Scranton swag. <laughs> and I can personally attest uh, that he wore the purple with pride at the Jersey Shore this summer. In fact, our application base from Cape May, New Jersey soared in the month of, month of July. But finally, and most seriously, I want to thank Father Martin in a broader sense for being, over the years, a sign of hope and connection for young people as you all attempt to explore your faith and your church. I personally know of so many instances where Father Martin's words have made an enormous difference in the lives of young people and help them to see in the church a place of connection and to encounter there a God of welcome. So Jim, especially as a brother Jesuit, I'm enormously proud of the work you've done and continue to do. And thank you so much for being with us tonight.
So now, one more important event. It's time for book signings, which will be right over here. So those of you who bring your Jesuit guides, bring all your other books, and we'll make Father Martin stay late into the night signing them. Thank you.